So today we'll be looking at Matthew 13, 44 to 58. So I'll be looking at the parables of the kingdom. Uh, so my emphasis will be about four to five uh, key part of this uh, verse. So I'll look at the treasures with the pears, and I'll look at the kingdom um, like into the dragnet. And also I will look at um, the place of the storehouse and honor. Okay, so we've got a lot to do today. So let's just let's just pray. Lord, as we go into your word today, we ask that Holy Spirit, I just submit myself to you. Use me, Lord, for your glory. Let everyone that will listen to this word may they be blessed, Lord. Let it not just be words for words' sake, but Lord, let your Holy Spirit breathe on those words. And let it impact the lives of men. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Matthew 13, 44 to 58. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into the containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out the treasures, out of his treasures, what is new and what is old. And when Jesus had finished this parable, he went away from there. And coming to his own town, he taught them in their synagogue. So that they were astonished and said, Where does this man get this wisdom and this mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And not all his sisters with us. Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. <laughs> but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their own belief. I would like to just start with a very simple question. Or questions. Uh, what would you say is a, if I were to see you and say, what is your most valued possession? What would you say? If I said to you, what is that one thing that you have a high sentimental value to and you will not let go? Okay, what would that thing be? How precious is that thing to you? How would you define? How would you describe something that you feel? has a lot of value that you will not let go. Now, while you ponder on that question, we see in from verse 44, Jesus began to reveal the true kingdom. Jesus began to open the eyes of the disciples to what exactly the kingdom can be likened to and how important it is for them to understand this. And so we pick it up from verse 44. Verse 44. The treasure, the kingdom is likened to a treasure. In verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. When the man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought the field. So we are told that this man found this treasure. And he was so excited. He went and sold everything. Now that tells me something very important. 
that this man found this treasure and immediately knew that this treasure is so valuable. Okay, because for somebody to find one thing and decide that everything he has should be sold to buy this one thing. And this man did this with so much joy because he found this treasure that was hidden in the field. What does that tell us about the kingdom of heaven? Now, what I want to do is I'm, I'm going to contrast this or compare this with uh, verses uh, 45 to 46 to see how the Holy Spirit will help us to understand how the two link together. Now, the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than anything else we can have. And a person must be willing to give up everything to obtain it. And that's exactly what this man decided to do. He found the kingdom and then decided that everything he has, he needs to give it up for the sake of the kingdom. For the sake of the kingdom. And, and, and my challenge to you today is, will you be willing to give up everything for the sake of the kingdom? Would you be willing to do like this man? To give up everything. For the sake of the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God. Is so valuable. There is nothing more valuable. Than the kingdom of God. There is nothing worth more. Than to know. That there is a king. And there is a kingdom. And I am part of that kingdom. And so when this man found this. He sold everything. Now what does that mean in our lives today? That Jesus will have us to give up everything just for the kingdom. Jesus will have us to consider that when we come to him, we're not giving him the rest. We are giving him the best. You see, God wants your best. He doesn't want the rest. But oftentimes we want to give God the rest and leave the best for ourselves. But oh, my friend... God expects you to give him your best. And the best means that everything you have, you give to him. In the Proverbs 23, 26, say, my son, give me your heart. You see, God who knows that whoever controls the heart controls the life. And so God is looking for your heart. And so when this man found this treasure, he was willing to sell everything for the sake of getting this treasure. And my challenge to you today is that the man gave up everything. And I want to urge you today to give up everything. Everything for God. You have tried. You have tried. The Bible says, come unto me, all you who are weak and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Friends. You have tried. You're carrying the burden. You know. And God is saying to you today. Why don't you give it up. And let me come in. And let me have my way in your life. Let me come in. And let me dine with you. Find me. I'm the treasure you need. You see many looking for answers. Far and wide. Many searching. Looking for treasures in the wrong places. And God is saying, oh my son, oh my daughter, if only you know that there's treasure in me. And you come, you say, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I give you my life. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I want to know the kingdom. I want to come into the kingdom. Because the kingdom is so important. And what Jesus, what God is asking us in verse 44, he showed it in verse 45 and 46. In the parable of the pearls. And the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, if you look at verse 44, you see... He's talking about a man finding and selling everything. 
but in verse 45 to 47, okay, that Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven is not the precious pearl, but the merchant. And what is the merchant looking for? He's looking for fine pearls. Jesus is now displaying another aspect of the kingdom. Okay, that the kingdom pays the ultimate price to possess the pearl. Now, you have that valuable item that the merchant is looking for. The Bible says that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says in, in Romans that God did not spare his son, but freely gave him up. So God gave up a son for us. And so for verse 45 and 46 is showing us that the merchant there is God. Who is willing to pay everything just for one soul. Just for one soul. Oh, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for me while I was still a sinner. That is marvelous. That is amazing. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending love of God. The love that chases me down and leaves the 99. That's the marching for you. That is God. God will not give up. There's no shadow. He won't light up. <laughs> There's no mountain. He won't climb. Just to come after you. Oh, there's no wall, it won't kick down. No lie, it won't tear down. Just for you. The merchant is looking for you. God is looking for you today. If you're listening to this and you don't know Jesus. Oh, he died for you. He died for you. And all he's saying to you in Proverbs 23, 26. My son, my daughter, give me your heart. Give me your heart today. I want everything. He is either Lord of all or not Lord at all. Jesus cannot compete in your life. He wants to be the Lord of all. He wants the best and not the rest. You see, the Bible talks in Genesis chapter 4 of two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain felt he could just give God anything. But Abel, you know, gave God the finest, the first fruit. And God had respect for Abel, but not for Cain. You see, you might be a Christian and you say, well, I go to church. But are you giving your best for the Lord? Have you given your heart to him? You know, the Bible says, I love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Is that what you're doing? When the merchant found that pair, he sold everything and bought it. And the Bible says we are purchased, we are bought with a price. That's what the Bible says. Say you are bought with a price. Although salvation is free, but it cost Jesus to die on the cross. It, it cost Jesus his life. And God did not spare his only begotten son. That was the most precious thing to God. But God was willing to give up Jesus just for me. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior. And all he wants from me is to say, hold to Jesus, like that beautiful hymn. Say, hold to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will have a love and trust him. Oh, would you say that today? That all to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give you my life. I give you my soul today. I give you everything. I give you everything, Lord. I give you everything. Because when God gave Jesus, he gave his best. And God wants the best from us. I had a story uh, of, of a young boy. Uh, a preacher came into his village and talked about giving their best to Jesus. And then the preacher said that was it God, you know, gave his only begotten son. He gave his best. You know, Jesus, because he loved us. Lay down his life. That what have you come with today? As the best you can give Jesus. And this boy had no money. He had nothing. 
and there was an offering basket in the front, and everybody had to walk to the front uh, to give whatever they have. And this boy got to the front. He had no money, and he dipped himself in the container. And the preacher said, boy, what are you doing? And the story goes, the boy began to cry. He said, Jesus gave it all for me. Jesus paid it all for me. What else can I give? And to give him my heart. And to give him my soul. And that is why I've dipped myself in the container. Because I can only give myself to him. Friends. Have you given your heart to Jesus today? Have you surrendered all to him? He wants your best. You can't give him the rest. You can't. You have tried. You are weighed down. You, there's a lot of burden on, on your shoulder. Bring it to Jesus today. Are you a Christian? Oh. Are you still giving your best to him? We'll come back. And when we look at a storehouse, we will look at you know the, 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 the cost of discipleship. What it means to have a storehouse where you can bring up something old and something new. But the emphasis I want to lay at this point is that what Jesus is asking of you is what he has done himself. So God will not put a burden on you that you cannot meet. His Bible says his commands are not grievous. So today I will urge you to surrender your heart to Jesus. Because he's the most amazing treasure you can ever have. Oh, my friend, not silver, not gold. Oh, Paul said in Philippians 3. He said, whatever were gains to me, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more? I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. This was a man that went about killing people. But when he met Jesus... The Bible says he considered knowing Jesus what more than anything else. Oh, my friend, would you sit down today? You know, I love that song. You're knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my joy. You're my confidence. Knowing Jesus is all. Do you know him? Does he know you? Does he know you today? Oh, knowing Jesus is everything. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, knowing Jesus. What more can be more valuable? What more, what more, what more? What more can be so more important than knowing Jesus? Oh, knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus, oh, knowing Jesus, oh, knowing Jesus. Do you know him? Does he know you? And if you know him, are you still giving him your best all the time? There's nothing he will not do just for you. He shed his blood for you. He shed his blood for you. He gave up everything. Everything for you. Everything. He said, well, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame just for me. Just for me. Just for me. Oh, that is just so much to comprehend. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for the cross. Thank you for choosing to die for me. Hallelujah. And then if you look at from uh, verse 47. Jesus began to talk about the parable of the net, the dragnet. And he talks about the kingdom of God being like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good 
into containers and threw away the bag. Now, I, I wouldn't dwell too much on this. And what I would urge you to do is last week, um, Duncan preached a lovely message on the Bible of the weeds. And there's a lot of similarity between uh, what he spoke about last week and uh, the, the Bible of the dragnet. Because in this, what we see or what we find is that the kingdom attracts different types of people. Okay? But what happens is nobody knows, you know, the good fish and the bad fish. But at the end of time, at the end of time, the angel will come and separate. And I pray for you, my friends, that when the time of separating comes, that you will be the good and not the evil one. That you will be part of the good and not part of the evil. Okay? The kingdom attracts different people. And what that tells us as well is that we have to have contact without contamination. Because he was a, a fishing net that caught different fishes. And God is saying that, yeah, you will mingle with people in the world. You can have contact, but no contamination. You know, just do your thing for me. You know, it doesn't matter where you work. Because God won champions of faith in secular arena. So, you know, we can't live our lives just in church every day. We have to go out there. We have to mix with the bad fishes. And hopefully we can even bring them to God. Okay. So God demands of us. Okay. To have contact without contamination. And at the end of time. You know. The judgment day. There will be a separation. And it doesn't even have to be that you're non-Christian. You know. I prayed. And there's a place where the Bible talks about Jesus. Saying that. Oh. Um, and he said, you know, you will be cast into hell because your work is of iniquity. And Jesus said, I knew you not. You know, I pray today that that will not be your portion. And the only way that will not be your portion is if you would consider to accept Jesus into your life as your Lord and as your Savior. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to quickly talk about is the storehouse. And uh, so we pick it up from verse uh, 51. And Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes. And he said to them, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Now what does that mean? All of a sudden, Jesus is talking about something else. Because he asked the disciples whether they understood. And they said they did. And Jesus began to say that, you know, if you understand, you are like a scribe. Who has a storehouse. Okay. And you're bringing out of your treasure what is new and what is old. Now, what does that mean for us? So when you find the treasure, you ought to be a disciple, bringing out of your treasure what is old and what is new. I think this place really speaks more to us as Christians, that God expects of us, demands of us, that because we have been trained for the kingdom of heaven, we should be like the master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Now, I just want to ask you a question. When was the last time you encountered God? When was the last time you encountered God? Because this place is talking. I know some commentators feel like, you know, the, the scribe being uh, somebody who is vast in the law and all that is able to explain the whole Testament and the New Testament. But I, I would like to take it a bit further to say that when Jesus is referring to, you know, the master of the house, he's talking about somebody who has spent time in his presence and is able to bring out of his treasure what is old and what is new. Now, the key thing for us is that God wants us 
to have old treasures and to have new treasures. Now, when I say old treasures, the old treasures are the dealings of God in the past. The whole treasures are the way God has dealt with you. Oh, the victories you've had, the miracles you've had. But God does not want you to just dwell on the whole treasures. Oh, he wants you to have new treasures, new treasures, new things, new revelation, new testimonies, you know, new stories of God's faithfulness. God wants us as Christians to be able to have in our storehouse something good, something whole, and something new. So that when you come in contact with people, oh, your story is not the story of the past. Your story is still relevant today. You know, I pray as Christians. You know, I've read, uh, I've read many biographies. I've read many stories of revival. Oh, we speak about the Welsh revival. We speak about, you know, different revival in different countries. And I'm saying, the Lord, what about today? That God does not want us to talk about old treasures. God wants us to talk about new treasures. What God is doing today. But the Bible said that Jesus, the same yesterday, <laughs> the same today, and the same forever. So if Jesus did it yesterday, he's able to do it today. And he's able to do it tomorrow as well. So the revivers, the awakenings that we've listened to, we've heard. I'm saying the Lord... Let it happen in our day as well. That we will be able to bring forth new treasures. That we will not just dwell on the past. Oh yeah, two years ago we planted a church. That is old news. That is not the story anymore. What is the story we are writing today? Is that God is doing things in people's lives. That God is changing lives. Because we can plant a church. And that can be in the past. And so, oh, we planted. We used to. What are you doing now? That is what God is laying on my heart to say to you today. As a church, we must not dwell in the past. We must, we must not talk in past tense. We must not say, oh, yes, oh, we planted. We planted. But what are we planting now? God does not dwell in the past. He wants to dwell in the present as well. Oh, those revivers in the past. Ah, oh, they're amazing. But no, I don't want them. I want something now. You know, I, I read in, in, in 1 John. You know, John said, See, that which was from the beginning, which our eyes have seen, which our ears have heard, which we have handled. I want to handle God's word today. Oh, I want miracles in my day. I want the, the blind to see. I want the, the lame to work. I want the dead to rise again. I've heard it in the past. Oh, I've heard of John Wesley. I've heard of different great men of God. Oh, thank God for Terry Vogel as well. Thank for, for the Patriots. But I'm praying that, Lord, I want to write our story. That Lord, I refuse to listen and read the stories of men. That God, in our generation, we are going to write a story. Because guess what, guys? Today will be the past in years to come. And what will people say when they read about our past? Would they say that, look at Dyer, look at Christ Church Ferrum. They gave their heart to Jesus. They prayed. They fasted. They cried to God for a reawakening, for a revival. And look at what God did in that time. Oh, there was a mighty move of the Spirit of God. The lame could walk. The blind could see. Lives were changed. That's the story, my friend. I don't care about how many. All I care about is what God is doing in my day. And that is what that place is talking about. You are the master. And you are able to bring out of your treasure. What is hold. And what is new. We can talk about the hold. But we have got the new. I want to be relevant. 
I just want to talk about stories. I want us to make stories. I want us to write a story. And the stories we'll write, the new treasures, is looking at the whole treasures. Because you know what? When, the, when, when Israel goes through a journey, and like when they went to Jericho, the Bible says that God asked them to pick up stones as a memorial. Do you know why? It is not because for them to remember the past. It's for them to remember the faithfulness of God in the past. And for them to know that if he did it in the past, he's able to do it now. If God raised the dead in the past, he's still the same God. Oh, ye of little faith. Why do you downgrade the Bible? Why do you make it and say what has happened in the past cannot happen in a day? Let's cry to God. Because God can do it in a day. God can do it. Because the kingdom of heaven is still here. It's still here. And the only thing is for us to act in faith. We're going to rise up. We're going to trust the Lord to help us. So that we can live for him in our day. We can write a story. You can write a story. And lastly we see that Jesus had finished this parables. And he went away and he went to his hometown. And the people were astonished. And they began to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> Where what, what is this Jesus? Oh and I pray for you my friend. That your friends will see you and they will look at you like, wow, is it the same person? They will look at, no, no, that is not Johnny. That's Johnny, yes. So is this not Jesus? Is this not the carpenter's son? Because when God's hand comes upon your life, my friend, something will change about you. Something changes on the inside of you. Something changes. That when men see you, they'll be, they'll be wondering, <coughs> what? What has happened to Christ Church Pharaoh? What has happened to the people there? And what has happened is that we have met the Savior. We have given our heart to Him. We want to seek Him with all of our heart. But these this folks did not see that something has shifted for Jesus. Because there are two things I just want to unpick very quickly. Is that something changed. Jesus had a dimension of grace upon his life that they could not see. Because of their unbelief. Because they belittled. They looked at him and they could not understand what God, what, how things could happen through his life. And I want to hold you as well. You know. That the people that God has placed in charge, the people that, you know, uh, preachers and, and maybe you've got friends and you look at them and look, you know, that person is just a common person. But when God's hand comes upon a man's life, God changes that man forever. And he, he could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. And I hope that you don't have unbelief today. That if I pray for you today, imagine, so I can just, okay, uh, as I'm talking to you, you know, and I can just say, I'm going to pray for you. And I hope you will not say, well, who is this person that wants to pray for me? You know, I can go and, you know, listen to, you know, somebody who has got a master in theology, you know, uh, you know, and you might just despise the person. Rather than accept and receive what the person is saying in your life. Or are you like that? You know, our church, we're so blessed with, you know, you know we've got about a few people who pray from time to time. Do you have the same response to people when they preach? Oh, it's not Duncan talking today, so I'm not going to listen. And I hope we don't have people like that in our church. Oh, it's Jason preaching today, so Jason preaches not. No, it, God has given different people different dimensions of grace. And we must be willing to accept them. I bring a dimension. Jason brings a dimension. Jeff brings a dimension when he preaches. Duncan brings a dimension. You know. So God has blessed us, you know. And there are different people in our church as well. You know, when they pray, they bring prophetic insight. 
you know, when, when they pray. So we must be willing to receive people and don't look at them. And because we cannot see beyond their frailties, we then despise what they bring to us, you know. And that way, um, we, 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 we don't accept it, you know. So I urge you that, you know, just be open to what God brings to you and to what God brings through people's life. All right, so I just want to just start the field in a call to action. You know, what have you found? This man found the treasure. He sold everything. Are you willing to sell everything for the sake of the kingdom? Because what God is asking of you is what he did himself. He gave up his son for you. He gave up everything just for you. Have you found the kingdom? Have you found the kingdom? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Like I said, he said, my son, give me your heart. Paul said, I consider everything lost just for the worth of knowing Jesus. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What can a man give in exchange? For his soul. What can you give in exchange? Oh, friends, I've got a job to the glory of God. And I can say that, yes, I'm pursuing money because I get paid. But that's not where my heart is. When money becomes gold in your life, then God cannot take his place. When you pursue gold, make sure you pursue gold for the right reasons. For what does it profit a man if he pursues gold for all his life and forget his own soul? Just like that man, he said, let my soul rejoice. And God said, tonight <laughs> your soul will be taken from you. You can't give anything in exchange for your soul. Now that you've got this time, why don't you think about the value of your soul. Why don't you say to God today, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you all. I give you all. I give you all. The Bible said, taste and see the Lord is good. The Lord, help me. I want to know you. I want to know you. When you meet with people, is there contact with that contamination? Do you affect people or do they affect you? Do you know what will happen at the end of time? Do you know you'll be a, a good fish or a bad fish? How are you living your life today? Have you given God your heart? Everything. What kind of treasure are you bringing out of your house? Are you still talking about the hold? The hold. The things that have happened in the past. And, and, and I am not saying that that is wrong. Oh, my friends, if I talk about the things God has done in my life in the past. Oh, the encounters I've had. Oh, the, oh I've, I've had some encounters. And, and, I'm, I, and I just thank God for those encounters. You know, times of prayers. You know, times where, you know... You know, we've pray, I've prayed for somebody and, and God did miraculous things in that person's life. And I've had a few testimonies like that. But guess what, guys? I count all those things lost. I am not going to live in the past anymore. I want a new revelation, a new treasure. And as a church, we will, be not, we will not be playing church. If church is all about just coming on Sunday, close the door. I want his glory. I want his power. I want his Shekinah presence every Sunday. That's all I cry for. Oh, a heart that longs for God. That's a cry of my heart today. Is that the cry of your heart, my friend? Is that what you desire? That beyond everything, Knowing Jesus. 
For when I know Jesus, it makes a difference in my life. When I know Jesus, it does great things. 